The last Blender release of the year is about to drop in about a week, and this time it's 4.0, which means it's a big one. The Blender team have really outdone themselves with a lot of cool new toys for us to play with, so I thought today I would go through four or five of my favorite new features coming to Blender in the next few weeks. Okay, so let's just get this first one out the way. Probably the biggest feature that's coming to Blender 4.0 is light linking. It's probably the most requested feature in Blender's history, and for good reason, because it is actually very important. If you've been living in a cave or you're new to Blender, you might not know what light linking is. Essentially, it's the idea that you can control the influence of each light source in the scene. So you can say this light doesn't affect this object or this light doesn't cause this object to cast a shadow. Now, I did make a video briefly a few months ago when light linking was first kind of introduced. But let's just go over exactly how it works. OK, so this is really easy to set up. All you have to do is select the light source that you want to make the changes on. And if you go to the object panel and then shading and open up light linking, what you can do is you can select a collection from your collection menu or you can just drag and drop uh, into a new collection. So I can say the cube, the plane and the Suzanne and add all of these into here. Then let's say we've got this blue light here. Let's say I don't want this blue light to shine onto the side of the monkey head. All I have to do is turn this light off for Suzanne and she loses the blue light. Or if I don't want the light to shine on this plane here, I can turn that off and I can turn it off for the cube. Now what you'll notice is that this does only affect direct light. So if I turn this off for the plane, for instance, it'll lose most of the light, but it still has some blue light over here. And the reason for that is because that is light which has been reflected off the side of this cube and then it's bouncing down. There's no direct light but there is indirect light. And you can do the same thing for shadows too. If I just go down to shadow linking and I can just add the collection I've just made. Let's say we want to um, exclude the plane. Then the plane will now get no shadows or cube. Same thing. It is not casting a shadow. People who use other software like Maya, 3D Studio Max and Cinema 4D often cite light linking as one of the reasons why they won't move to Blender. So now that Blender has it, I am going to be curious to see how many of those people were actually just talking shit and how many of them will now move over to Blender. This next feature is really exciting because it should make your renders look more realistic without you having to do any extra work. Now, color theory is really complex, far too complex for this video. So I'm going to give you a very brief explanation of the problem. So essentially, uh, Blender is capable of producing a massive amount of colors and it does it in a linear scale. That's not how our eyes work and it's certainly not how a computer monitor works. So it needs to get all of these colors and adapt them to about 16.7 million colors that's used on a typical monitor with sRGB. The problem is that it tends to look really bad. So I have this old scene of mine here and I've set the color management view transform to raw. This is essentially just no changes being made to the colors. We're getting what Blender's created and we're trying to map them onto 256 levels of red, green and blue. And obviously it looks terrible. It's way too contrasty and we have no values hardly in the middle range, which is what the human eye is accustomed to seeing. So originally we had this view transform, which was called standard, which was obviously better than what we had before, but it still had a pretty low dynamic range. You can see here that the white values are like really clipped and the same on this sign here and the black values as well are just way too dark. So a few years ago, we got Filmic, which was definitely an improvement. If we switch to Filmic, you can see that we now have uh, more colors in the mid ranges and these whites now here are no longer blown out and the darks look a little bit better too with a bit more detail. So the new version is called AGX and the big improvement here is how it handles saturated light colors. You can see here that this sign in real life probably wouldn't be uh, this color orange. If you have a light, typically it starts to shift in hue as it gets lighter and obviously it starts to look more and more white. The same over here we have a light and it looks kind of blue but lights should be pretty much white in the middle in fact the reflection of this light is actually lighter than the light itself so if we change this over to agx 
can see that now we have much more realistic lights where the light and the light reflection is more similar in color. And now we have less saturation over here as well. Now this is a breaking change, meaning that AGX is now the default for color management. But if you're messing around with some old scenes or you've been working on a project and you're making new scenes written 4.0, you might want to switch over to Filmic if that's what you've been using. But going forward, I would suggest you use AGX because once you tweak the look with some contrast and things, you're going to get it looking much better. Here's a really good comparison from the Blender Open movie from last year showing how it looked before and how things look now. I think everyone will agree it definitely looks much better now. So we've also had a big upgrade to the way that objects are transformed and laid out in the scene. Now we've always had the snapping option before and you can snap on increment which will move on increments on the grid or what I usually have this set to is vertex which will try and snap one vertex to the other. The problem is Blender doesn't know which vertex you want to snap to where. So you can see if we put it on this side it snaps to the right of the box and if we put it on this side it tries to put the smaller box inside the bigger one and we can't move it up or down. What I tend to do is use uh, press G and then just hold down control and you can easily just enable and disable snapping. You still kind of have this problem if you're trying to line things up where you have to move around the viewport and do all sorts of stuff just to get things in the right place. But now all you have to do is press G and then if you hit B you can select which point you want to snap from. I'm going to say this one and then you can snap to wherever you want, left click and it'll confirm. This is a life changer. I've been using this for the last couple of weeks and honestly it's absolutely great. Another excellent transform feature while I'm on the topic. Uh, if you wanted to move something around before, you couldn't grab something and then move around the scene, right? If I grab this and then I hold shift and I try to pan, it tries to do all this weird stuff. Now that was a real pain if you were trying to say, I don't know, if you had like a long shelf and you were trying to move a box along a shelf, you would have to like keep sliding along and moving or you would have to zoom all the way out and then zoom back in. But now you can just press G, pull down Alt and then if we press Shift, we can just move around wherever we want. Genius. Those Blender guys are geniuses. The next feature which totally caught me off guard is called Node Tools. It's essentially a way that you can make your own operators in Blender. So if you don't have any experience with uh, Python programming for example, you know a little bit about geometry nodes, you can now essentially make your own tools in Blender that you can apply in edit mode. So let me give you an example. I'm just going to add a cube to the scene here. I'm just going to make the most basic of tools I'm going to go into the geometry node setup, but we don't need an actual geometry node modifier on here. To go to modifier, we can now create a tool. Let's make a new tool and I'm going to search for um, transform geometry and then I'm going to rotate it 20 degrees and I'm going to scale it up by 1.2. So let's say for whatever reason why you're modeling, that's something that you find yourself continually doing. And we're going to call this, um, call this tool one. Now, if we're in layout mode and we're, in, we're going to edit mode, we can just search for tool one. And every time we run that tool, which we can just keep doing with shift and R, it'll repeat the action. It'll get larger and it'll rotate every time. Now, this is obviously a very basic example, but you can do anything that you can do in geometry nodes like this. So instead of continually having to like apply geometry nodes and then go back into edit mode, it's something that you can just have on the fly. And I've seen some examples already of people doing some very impressive stuff with this. Now, one of the really cool things about this is the fact that you can actually expose values as well with a little pop up. So let's say, for example, we want to be able to control the amount of rotation. We could get a combine XYZ node, plug this into rotation and then just grab this and plug that into the Z. Now, if we run our tool, 
we'll have a pop-up here where we can actually control the rotation here as well. Once again, this is a very simple example, but you can, you can do anything you want with it essentially. Finally, you're going to notice some changes to the printable shader. For a start, it's much more compact and everything is pushed into these uh, different headings, which I'm not sure about yet, especially the order of them. It's probably just because it's breaking muscle memory, but it can do some really cool things now. Like, for instance, we've always had the sheen value, which is supposed to uh, kind of look like microfibers on a surface. Like if you're making cloth, for example, and you want to replicate the tiny little bits of fluff on the cloth, it didn't really work very well before, but now we have a new system for it, which actually works really, really well. Uh, one of the cool things about this now is it does a really good job of replicating dust. So if we get a noise texture, for instance, and plug this into the weight of the sheen, and then maybe put this through color ramp, just to play with this a little bit, see that it gives us this really nice sort of dusty effect very very easily and it's very customizable and you can do all sorts of stuff with it if you open up some of these other settings you can see that we now have a new clear coat system as well i believe which seems to be much more accurate and there's just lots of changes in general to how things are calculated to make them more physically accurate all on the road to improving the principal shader which is something that's been in the works for a while since we're talking about changes to the user interface, there has been a little bit of an overhaul in general, and it is worth mentioning something else, which I'm not too keen on. If you add a modifier now, it splits everything into these little drop downs. It's extra like sort of button clicks. I don't really like this. Overall, Blender 4.0 is looking fantastic. I highly recommend that you give it a download. Uh, on a separate note, I just came back from the Blender conference. I had an absolute blast. Talked to some great people, watched some great talks, drank some great beer, too much great beer. And I just had a wonderful time. I came back really inspired to do a lot of good work. If you want to watch some of the talks or all of the talks, they're actually all uploaded onto the official Blender YouTube channel. I'll leave a link to that in the description as well so you can catch up. You'll probably see me in the background in some of these videos, to be honest. Um, also, I have a new course that's coming out. It should be out in a week, maybe two weeks. It's all about interiors. I've been working on this for a long, long time and I'm really excited about it. But anyway, guys, just go download Blender 4.0, watch the Blender Conference videos, and I'll see you in a few days with another video.